Tonight's event is the 28th annual unveiling of the Deland Fall Festival of the Arts poster. I'm excited that we have the festival going this year. Last year we had to cancel it because of COVID. It was a hard decision, but it was the right decision, and we're just really working hard, hoping that this year is going to be a go. for me and for my people. Good evening everyone. Um, welcome and thank you for attending the poster unveiling of the 28th Fall Festival of the Arts The Land. Last year should have been the 28th but we kind of skipped it for obvious reasons and so we're uh, back doing it again this year, and it is the 28th. I'm Dorothy Gansberger. I'm the president of this year's festival. Um, I'd like to thank tonight's sponsors, Lisa Ogram, financial advisor, DeLand. <laughs> Kelly O'Leary, in memory of her wonderful mother, Conrad Realty, The Nest, and last but never least, Bill Budzinski and the Elusive I'd also like to thank the Museum of Art DeLand and Main Street DeLand Association for partnering uh, in putting on what is one of the premier events of the year in Delaware. The festival board and committees are with uh, great confidence uh, entering into the final stages of uh, planning for this year's festival. Uh, it wasn't the case last year. By this time, we had already made the hard but necessary decision to cancel the festival due to COVID. Last year was a difficult one for us. Tragically, we lost two people who had been very important uh, and integral to the success of the festival from its inception. Um, one of those is Don Nedebeck, who I'm sure you all know and love from seeing his artwork at the festival every year. Um, his wife, Liz, is here tonight. And with her permission, I'm going to read something that maybe I'm not, because I can't get onto my phone. I'm going to read a wonderful memory that she shared with us about Dawn and the beginning of the festival. So Liz says, I remember the evening when Harry Messersmith and Anna Tomczak came to our house for dinner and discussed the possibility of starting a good art show in Deland. Dawn said, I will do anything I can to promote it, but I am organizationally challenged. Which I think means he's a terrible administrator. He says it's a great idea, the rest is history, to coin a phrase it seems like yesterday. We also tragically lost Marianne Lawrence, who had been a member of our board and treasurer of our board and a huge supporter of the festival for years and years and years. And we miss her so much. Um, so uh, to say a little something about Mary Ann is her friend, colleague, and fellow board member, Becky McDonald. A Delandite since 1962 and a matriarch of our community, I am truly blessed by our friendship. Mary Ann added so much to our community with her love for the arts. She was actively involved in the West Volusia Arts community for more than 45 years. She was the chairman of the building committee for the Cultural Arts Center, served as president of the board of directors of the Deland Museum of Art, 
and was a performing member and volunteer with the Sands Theater Center. Her service with the museum led to a leadership role on the committee that conceived the Lands Cultural Arts Center and opened it in 1991. She was also involved in the founding of Delands Fall Festival of the Arts, which took place for the first time in 1992 and served for many years as its treasurer. Mary Ann introduced me to our Fall Festival of the Arts in 2008 as a volunteer and her shadow, and I've followed in her footsteps as treasurer ever since. I was lucky to learn from such an extraordinary woman and hope to continue to do her proud. Her daughter, Kelly O'Leary, here today, has also joined in her footsteps by joining our Fall Festival Board and continuing to do our community proud. Thank you for all you do, Kelly. And thank you to Mary Ann, who set the building blocks of where we are today as a festival. And now to introduce our uh, 28th annual featured artist, is uh, Judy Bradford, a member of the festival board. Good evening, everyone. And here we are. It's Florida. No air conditioning. This is a real thing. <laughs> Thank goodness for fans. We hope the power doesn't go out. Uh, I'm here to introduce Lauren, our Lauren Austin, our featured artist for 2021. She's an Orlando fiber artist, uh, and she uses mixed media quilting techniques and uh, and contemporary printmaking methods to illustrate her storytelling works on fabric. Work is rich in texture. I'm going to try to turn this. Success. Small successes. Her work is rich in meaning and texture and history. It utilizes a complex system of contemporary techniques and traditional needlework. French knots, meticulous hand stitching, and traditional indigo dyeing comes together with cyanotype prints printmaking techniques and freehand machine elements. Travel has been a big influence for her. Before devoting herself to art, she worked with, uh, she worked as a U.S. diplomat, traveling in Latin America. Then she was a uh, human rights lawyer and a legal writing professor in Syracuse. She has traveled. She was community artist in New Smyrna Beach at the Atlantic Center for the Arts, then went to China to study fabric techniques and did workshops and things there as well. Learned Chinese. And now she's back in Central Florida and she's uh, working with the Hannibal Heritage Center down. Not sure what that is. Maitland Winter, Winter Park. Okay. You know, it's a long way away for me. <laughs> she's uh, so she's currently down there. We're very happy to have her on board as our feature artist, and she's been instrumental in helping us set up a diversity committee for the festival, in which we hope to knit together more black artists and white artists in our community. Please welcome yeah. Laura Knox. start with the beginning and we have to say 
Ashe. We have to say Ashe. Ashe. And what that means is, it is a joyful shout. It is a creative shout. It is, we are getting busy making things, making change, making our way and making our place. And I have to give a shout out to the story quilters of Hannibal Square Heritage Center. That's where my creation lives, breathes, and is born. I see, even though she never knew them, she know my mother knows them. She has been gone a long time with the ancestors, but she sees what we are doing as to all our ancestors. So, making things for me starts with drawing. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm going to need to give you the question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't click and talk at the same time. Drawing is what I do compulsively. And I have more pictures of my sons as drawings than as photographs. And I have in the cloud 17,000 photographs. So I don't want to talk about all the sketchbooks. <laughs> this is from a sketchbook when I was in Kenya. I went twice and taught art at an orphanage in Kakamega in the Western province. And these were children who were orphaned because of the AIDS. And this place was run by Quakers. And if you didn't know, there are more Quakers in Kenya than in all the rest of the world. Wow. Uh, they're different than the Quakers here. But I was very nervous about going to teach on the continent because I knew even though I had never been there, that there was more knowledge there than I could ever imagine. And that I was actually going to learn. And that's why the drawing was helpful. One, because it shut me up. And people would talk to me while I was drawing them. And that is how I developed relationships. And that has stayed with me ever since. Okay, you can go to the next one. Okay. This is Starbucks chair, when they used to have these big comfy chairs. And we would go and sit for hours, and I would draw. I have lots of pictures of salt shakers and Parmesan cheese shakers from Pizza House. Next one. And this is my son Jacob, I think also in a Starbucks, maybe in a Barnes & Noble. Um, he's now 30. Uh, okay, next. And this is Saturday. I'm working on a piece about the Buffalo Soldiers. Okay. And when we do historical quilts, and there are a lot of people doing historical quilts now about the black experience, and so it's a challenge to figure out how to do something different. And what I'm doing now is a piece that I'm going to call a view from the camp table. And it is a still life of everything the camp table would hold for a soldier. And of course, those soldiers had a pistol and a rifle. And the rifle that they had, one, one of the wonderful things is the military kept very good records, and so you can know exactly what the 9th and 10th cal cavalry uh, had 
as equipment, and they have a Colt uh, revolver and a Courtney, help me out. What was the name of the, the gun? Courtney? Courtney? What was the name of the rifle? Springfield. Springfield Car Karma. So Courtney and I went to um, a gun shop in Edgewater, and a collector brought in the guns that were from that time, the actual guns. And I drew my reference drawing from that gun. You can turn the next one. That's the drawing. And now I have used that drawing to make a, a, a fabric gun that will go on the quilt. I can't show it to you because it's for a museum and they said we can't show the stuff before it goes to the museum. Okay, next one. So my drawings ended up going on quilts. This drawing of my brother at New Smyrna Beach, best beach in the world, um, I drew him and then I scanned the drawing, printed it on fabric and sewed it into the quilt. Next one. But other drawings actually happen as part of the quilt. So this particular piece had a cyan print uh, of my drawing, uh, multiples of the same drawing. And there's a lot of hand stitching around it. But originally, it was a very dark blue. And when I quilted it, I was very excited because I use a particular batting that when you wash it, it scrunches up and makes this gorgeous texture to the pieces. I finished the binding at about 3 in the morning, and this was in 2014. And so I immediately put it in the washing machine. What I forgot was that with cyan prints, you cannot wash with a phosphate detergent or it destroys it. So I pull it out of the dryer. I didn't even look at it when I threw it in the dryer. I pull it out of the dryer and I open it up and the picture is gone. Now it's about 4.30 in the morning. And I'm ready to cut it to shreds with a pair of scissors. And fortunately, my husband, Brian, took the scissors out of my hand and said, you can fix it. And so what I did was I drew in the figures with the sewing machine. And that's what I do. I draw with the sewing machine. And so you can see all of the faces are different. All of the stances are a little different. This is what drawing can do for you. This is what drawing does for me. Next one. Now, I'm doing work with the Center for Birds of Prey in Maitland. And, well, actually half of it's in Maitland and half of it's in um, Eatonville, yes. I just escaped me senior moment for a moment. Uh, their parking lot is in Eatonville. We're, we're working on that. But I am their artist in residence. And what that means is I get to go and draw birds all the time. I am from a family of bird watchers. Uh, we are now on our third generation, really fourth generation, because my grandmother watched birds too. Uh, and uh, I love raptor birds, so I get to go and draw. And, uh, and that came out of taking sewing with me wherever I go. And I was working on a quilt that has a cyan print of a x-ray from when I broke my arm. And I used that x-ray and printed it on fabric and I was working on it. And one of the bird people, Beth Lott, 
watched me do that and working on that. She said, what is that? That's an x-ray. And I said, yeah, it's my x-ray. And when she looked at it, the break was like this. Okay. And she blanched at the side of it and said, if you were a bird, that break would have killed you. And she took me into, you know those doors that say, only authorized people enter here? I got to enter them. And behind that door was their triage center because they try to rehabilitate birds. If they can't, the birds stay there as bird ambassadors to help people understand what's going on with them. But they have a very good track record, and most of their birds end up back. They do. Uh, most of their birds end up being released in the wild. So she took me back and showed me about 150 x rays. And then she gave me x rays. So I have a whole stack of them. And I also have a whole bunch that she gave me digitally. And so I print those on fabric, and go ahead to the next one. Go ahead, yeah. And I print them on fabric, and now I'm making work about the birds, both with the x-rays and with the drawings. Be and I'm doing this because when people go to this center, what happens is they look at the artwork which has perfect birds. Nothing's wrong with them. They're stylized. Okay, mostly eagles, you know, and flags behind them, that kind of thing. And you can ask me later what I think about eagles, but no, that's okay. It's about the bird, okay? So go ahead, next one. And that's a detail uh, from that piece. Uh, but I want us to see the birds that are damaged, because I think they are invisible in the way that I understand as a black woman about being invisibilized by this society and culture. Next one. This is another piece with the x-ray. And the face I actually made I, I worked with uh, ceramics studio, Fulber's Ceramics in, in Houston, and I told them, I know what I want to make, I just want you to help me not kill myself or anybody else, okay? And I made 50 pieces that I could sew into quilts, and I'm never doing that again, so if you, uh, that's a limited edition, okay? It's a, like, I don't like art that can kill you, and pottery can do that, and I totally, uh, bow to people like Carly who work with this stuff all the time and manage to not kill themselves or other people. You are warriors of art. Next one. That's a close up of the piece. Um, I wanted to put holes in things and be able to sew them into holes. Uh -huh. I make epic pieces and size matters with epic. This is half of a six foot tall, um, I think it's the total four panels are maybe eight feet wide. And it is the story of Everett Sandals' life. Dr. Sandals is a pediatrician uh, a friend of mine and a mentee of my father, uh, Robert Austin, who is a pediatrician uh, for 50 years. And uh, I wanted to put Everett's life of being raised as the second youngest of 15 children in Midland, uh, Texas, and getting to where he is now, and I wanted to put that in fabric. So I went with him to Midland, I uh, took photos, I uh, talked to him incessantly for two years, and I produced this piece in China. The next one. And those are some of the French knots that 
Barb was talking about. Uh, so I put that in that piece. Next one. And this is the second two panels. Um, now what I am doing with my drawings is figuring out, what I think one of the hallmarks of my work is figuring out how to use new processes, particularly if they're old. So this piece, the woman's body, her arms, her face, and her hair are a stone lithograph on fabric. So I learned stone lithography uh, first from Florence Hatcher at Penland, and then from Charles Kreiner in Houston. And Charles Kreiner uh, apprenticed and pulled prints for John Biggers, one of the icons of black art. So I feel very blessed yet comfortable with this medium that is very, very hard to work with and involves drawing on stone, etching your drawing uh, into the stone and then printing. And then after you are through with your run, you destroy the top of the stone so that you can do something else. So this is a true limited edition. We talk a lot in art about limited editions, but now with the computer, you can never be sure that your edition is actually truly limited. The only way you can truly know that is if your artist is using one of these processes. And I intend to get very, very good at them because I like that idea. So I made a bunch of these on paper and a bunch on fabric. And this is one of them. She is beaded, I'm going to go to the next one, all in her hair and in the feathers of the osprey are tiny blue and black seed beads. Next one. Her body and tail are also beaded. All of those beads are sewn on by me because I am an ego artist. Everything is done by me. The fabric colors I made. Okay? All of the sewing I do. Okay? And my group, they know that this is how we roll. Okay, we do our thing, no one else's thing. Next one. Okay. The shells in this piece and found objects mostly are from New Smyrna Beach. But that tiny jiname, that African symbol that looks like, I don't know what it looks like, but, but, I made that with a laser cutter. <laughs> a laser, laser, yes, that's what I did. And so, again, it's not that I don't like technology. I love technology. I love video games. I love all of that, okay? But it's got to be me doing it, not someone doing it for me. Next one. And this piece, this is my heart, okay? And this is my heart because it has birds. This owl is the bird from, is a bird from the Birds of Prey Center. His name is Marlin, though I call him Tula, which is the um, Kiswahili name for owl. And Merlin is a bird ambassador because he only has one eye and uh, he imprinted as a baby. But the little boy is holding a stuffed owl that I found in my mother's sewing basket after she died. And I was carrying that owl around for years. And when I made this piece, I realized that the little boy and the owl were already made. But then I realized that the boy was talking to the owl about his toy owl. And that is part of what I do with my work, is there is family, there is history, there is my people, 
There is all of that in it. Okay? And all of that fabric, I dyed, next one. And all of the fabric in this, except for the mud club, which is that dark brown and white geometric printing, which is from a piece of Mali mud cloth that my mother brought me from West Africa, where she served in the foreign service. And this is another bird from the sun. Next one. And that's a detail. The branch is bark cloth, which is also from Mali. Next one. This piece, this is a piece that resides in the Bahamas. I did a year-long project of going one long weekend a month to Freetown in Grand Bahama Island. These are the people who are descended from people who were emancipated from slave ships that the British captured in the early 1800s. So these are people descended from people who were never slaves. And they know who they are because the British kept incredible records. And you can go to uh, the records house in Na Nassau, the National Archives, and you can find your ancestor there. I went there to see it because this is something dear to my heart and most black people would, you know, steal and do all sorts of things to get that kind of information. Next one. I took photos of the records. I made a silk screen with those words in a beautiful handwriting and you can see up in the upper uh, beyond the face, fabric with that writing. And the writing is not just a list of the people who were emancipated, but also of what they went through on the Middle Passage. So there's primary information. Next one. This is uh, a linoleum block print on fabric that I then sewed over. That's the figure in the middle. And then the leaves on the outside are magnolia leaves that I actually use to print with. And the beads, next one. Oh, no, hold back. The beads on the leaves glow in the dark. Uh, next one. This is uh, a picture of two pieces that I made about my father. And the photo in them was a little tiny photo about this big that I scanned and then printed, enlarged and printed on fabric and then built a whole piece of brown them. And he was and is a clothes horse, loves his suits. And so, uh, but he told me that he had play suits and nice suits. So I made one of each. And at the time I was working on it, working on it I was at a, a workshop in Newark of black quilters. And people came up and said that that's I was working on the, the one on the, on the right, the play suit. And they said, you know, all he older than me when they came up and said, that's not right, that suit is, is wrinkled, it wouldn't be that way. I said, it's his play suit. And I said, oh yeah, okay, I understand. <laughs> so, next one. This is my mother and my mother's brother, Beth and Douglas. And I imagine you can tell from the picture that they fought like cats and dogs all their lives. Okay? They did but they loved each other very, very much. And uh, we found this picture when my uncle passed away in January of 2020. Um, it was in his things, no one had ever seen it. 
and I put it on my phone. I look at it every day. I miss them so much. I took care of him with his son in his last month. Next one. And that made this peace. This is my, what I would call my COVID peace that I spent 2020 sowing beads on leaves. All of those leaves are 3D, they're tiny quilts in themselves. They stick out. This was the hardest piece I've ever worked on. Well, maybe there's a better one. This is now. Next one. The flowers, the beads and the flowers, and the beads and the leaves, and a lot of the thread glow in the dark. Next one. And of course, there's an owl. They're birds. Because he died in Rochester in the middle of winter, and it was a horrible situation, and I could not face making the work where it happened. So as the prerogative of an artist, I put him where I wanted him to be, and that was in the Florida wilds. And he would have liked to be there. Next one. That's his face. Next one. And that's it. And I think that's it. Is that the last one? Yeah. And now I'm delighted to present to you the poster for the 28th annual Fall Festival of the Arts to Land. This piece is titled Merlin, Tula, and Alboy. It's an art quilt. I believe she talked about that in her in her in her talk. Um, and it's been beautifully fra framed by Blake at Trophy Factory Plus Framing. Uh, Lauren has generously agreed to give us a little bit more of her time. She's going to be available to sign posters over at the front desk where you came in. And uh, oh, we have the original piece. Oh, let me see. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you for bringing that.